Awesome. Um, hey, everyone. So my name is Alex. I'm the director of New Markets Adventures at Moonfig. Um, and today we're going to be talking about international expansion. Obviously, it's the cross-border e-commerce stage. Uh, but specifically, like what that means for a relatively established, mature brand in, um, in, in a home market. What that means to then go from that position where you're leading in a domestic environment, but then no one really knows you in a, in a, in a new market. So what, what that means for us. So in terms of agenda, I'll we'll give a quick intro to Moonpig. Actually, maybe a quick question. Does everyone here know what Moonpig is? Okay, I think a lot of people. Are there any active users of Moonpig? Okay, a few. Not everyone, so hopefully a few more people will become active users by the end of this talk. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll go through that relatively quickly. We'll then focus on the international expansion piece, so briefly covering like why, focusing a little bit more on some of the challenges that brands like Moonpig um, face when going abroad, some of the success factors, at least as far as I see them and we've seen them at Moonpig thus far, um, and then deep dive a little bit into some of the specifics of what we've actually done at Moonpig on the international expansion front. Um, before we do that, just quickly, like, who am I? So as I said, I'm director of New Markets Adventures at Moonpig. Um, in practice, that means I cover international expansion. I also cover a lot of our different customer-facing business model and product um, innovation. So like, for example, we just launched a membership program earlier this year, which I encourage everyone to sign up for, $9.99 for 30% off on all your cars. Um, but, but, you know, even prior to this, International expansion has been something I've always focused on. So even as a consultant way back at the beginning of my career, even in some of the startup experiences I've had, um, and then actually on my last corporate role before Moonpig was at Lego, and in the last role I had within Lego, I was heading up international expansion. So it's a topic I'm super interested in. I will make some references to my Lego experience as well, although primarily uh, speak to, to what we've been doing and seeing at Moonpig. So it sounds like everyone's already familiar with Moonpig. What people may be less aware of is that we are a group actually at this stage. So there are four brands under the Moonpig group umbrella. So Moonpig, which it sounds like you're all familiar with, and I'll describe a little bit more in a second. Greece, which is our sister brand in the Netherlands. So basically Moon, a Dutch version of Moonpig. Um, and then last year we acquired two UK-based experiences businesses. So Buy Gift and Red Letter Days. Now, focusing a little bit more specifically on the Moonpig brand, why do we exist? Our purpose is really to create better, more personal connections between people. Um, the way we are trying to do that is by becoming the ultimate online gifting companion. I think online is a very critical piece here. We have no physical distribution, and frankly, I don't see that changing anytime in the near future. We are a purely uh, D2C e-commerce brand. Um, then in terms of how it works, so uh, as wrapped up in that vision, we are aiming to become, and I think we are in many ways already, quite a holistic gifting solution, right? You can come to us, you can buy cards, you can buy physical gifts now with the Red Letter Days and buy a gift, you can buy digital gift experiences, um, but we remain card first. That's obviously how we got our start in the UK 20 plus years ago or whatever it was. Um, and even for those gift and experiences journeys, we tend to be we're primarily card first. So what that means in practice is that the way Moonpig works is you come to our site, our app, pick a design from our ridiculously massive range, you personalize that um, or personalize that card. And actually there are an incredible number of ways you can personalize a Moonpig card now. So you can, I think we're probably most famous for adding photos to the front of the card. Um, so that photo upload feature but you can obviously also add text to the inside of the card. You can add photos to the inside of the card. You can now add video and audio files to the inside of the card through, um, through QR codes. So there's, there's a huge amount you can do to personalize a Moonpig card now, which is pretty cool. Um, once you've done that, you have the option to add a, a gift or, or an experience, and then you can choose to send direct to yourself. So you can hand deliver your, your card and or gift, um, or you can obviously like send it direct without ever having touched it. So. Maybe everyone knew that already, but I think it's just important to understand that. It'll make everything else make a little bit more sense in terms of the challenges we face when we go abroad. Um, and I do want to stress that most of our business comes from physical cards. Because as soon as we say online, people often think that we are an e-com business, or sorry, an e-card business, or at least people who are less familiar with the Moonpig brand. And we do sell e-cards, um, but first and foremost, we are a physical 
to our business. So then in terms of international expansion, or, or our geographic footprint, as you can see, we are predominantly a UK business. Moonfig was founded in the UK, has been here for whatever it was, 20 plus years. Um, more than 80% of our revenue comes from the, from the UK. We then have a little bit less than 20% in the Netherlands through that Greeks business that I mentioned. Um, and then this pathetic, tiny sliver at the end, the rest of the world, that's, that's me. That's what I'm doing, um, and that's ultimately what I'm, what I'm trying to grow. So hopefully, next time we release our annual report, that 2% will be much, much bigger. Um, before we talk about Moonfig specifically, some general stuff about international expansion. So I, I probably don't need to spend a huge amount of time talking about why companies should be interested in going abroad. I'm pretty sure all of you are here because you're already interested in that. Um, but I think like the key thing to note is, is international expansion is, it's again, it's a pretty obvious point, but is really difficult. Um, and it's difficult for a lot of reasons. This is a very non-exhaustive list, but some of those are operational. Um, when you go to new markets, you face new languages, new currencies, uh, different regulatory regimes, which even for categories like greeting cards and toys when I was at Lego, weirdly, do come into play. Um, customer differences are really important in terms of different marketing channels you have to use, um, different potentially distribution channels. That's not relevant for us, but it definitely is for other brands, was when I was at Lego. Um, and I think Another critical thing here is buying behavior. That's super important for us at Moonfig. If you think about it, gifting is something where there's quite a lot of cultural nuance attached to it. The way people gift is very different in different markets. And especially the way people send cards is very different in, in, in different markets. People in the UK are really weird. People in the UK send a lot more cards than anyone else in the world. Um, so that's kind of a, a big challenge that, that we have to face as well is is there is card sending behavior internationally, especially in the Anglo-Saxon markets like the US, Australia, Canada, et cetera. Um, but nowhere does it exist to the extent it does here and in the same way it does here. So that's kind of an interesting challenge we have to face. Um, then kind of moving beyond the operational considerations, the customer considerations, I think the internal side is, is, is also super critical, right? So there's the question of how much time and money you devote to this, how do you actually set your org up in the right way? But the one that I'm probably most interested in, where I want to focus the attention here, is on mindset. And the reason for that is because I think this is one that is very, very, very often ignored. There are very few consulting decks that I've seen from McKinsey or BCG, and I've seen many over the years, that mention mindset. But I think it's super important. And actually, I think it's a critical enabler to be able to unlock all the rest of the stuff that's, that's on this slide. So in, ter in terms of what that means from a mindset perspective, I like to think of it as you need to think like a startup, which is very difficult for big brands like Moonpig and Lego to do. So what I have here is just an image I've taken from the internet, classic kind of four phases for a startup, or at least a successful startup that will, that will hopefully go through. So one, you have this drunken walk, which is you know, where you're experimenting, trying to find who your customers are, trying to find product market fit, you then hopefully find that product market fit and start doubling down on, on what works. Um, hopefully then you're able to get to this hyper growth phase where you're just putting your foot on the gas, acquiring as many customers as possible, um, and then eventually you reach this much more mature uh, scale phase. Now, I think the problem is that a lot of established businesses are used to operating at this scale phase. But clearly in new markets, you actually need to be more at this drunken walk phase. And that's super, super difficult for even like the best marketing departments and, and every other team, frankly, in the organization because international expansion is a very cross-functional exercise. Um, and I think it's very difficult to actually transition between the, the, the two mindsets. So what does that mean in practice? Um, what does it mean to think like a startup? So I asked ChatGPT, I got a response and I just copied and pasted it in here. I actually think it's a, it's a pretty decent response. I, I agree with most of this. But one of the things that I thought was missing, um, which is a little bit more practical, is that when you're a startup, you recognize that actually like no one knows who you are. And generally speaking, like no one knows what you do or maybe even like why you do it. 
And this is something that I think, at least in my experience with, with Lego, and or both Lego and, and Moonpig and, and many other brands that I've spoken to, it's very difficult for people to understand that, especially if you think about Lego, which is you know, a far bigger business than, than Moonpig. There's this assumption that probably all of you have, certainly everyone in Lego has, which is everyone knows what Lego is. Everyone does not know what Lego is in, uh, in a lot of markets. Um, even actually when I was walking over here, I, I met someone who asked me where I worked and I said Moonpig and mentioned international expansion. And they were like, oh, well that must be easy because everyone knows what Moonpig is. No, no one knows what Moonpig is outside of the UK, that's it. Um, so this is like just a really, really, really important practical challenge that people, I think that brands struggle with when they, when they go abroad. Because kind of going back to that prior slide I had with you know, language challenges, payments, all the operational and customer things, I think big companies are actually like quite good at throwing a lot of resource and getting a lot of you know, different providers and vendors and consultants to support them with all those things. But if you don't kind of recognize this very fundamental fact, I think you're kind of screwed from the beginning. So just to kind of talk a little bit more about what that me actually means in practice from a, a Moonpig perspective, I think Moonpig, we have you know, many challenges in, in new markets, but I think like the two big ones is, one's kind of obvious, I've just been talking a lot about it, limited or, or to be honest, like no brand awareness in, in most markets we're trying to go into. I think the other challenge that we have is that outside of the UK, cards are almost exclusively an offline purchase. And in the UK, they're only really an online purchase because of Moonpig. Um, so that is actually like a weirdly difficult challenge to try to bring these very offline markets online. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. But again, if you're a startup, you're, you're kind of used to, from the outset, thinking about, okay, I need to create either a new channel or a new category or even an entirely new market. But again, actually, this is like quite difficult for, for a brand like Moonpig, who's used to operating in an environment where there is a very sizable online market in, um, in, in, in the UK, to then go to like an international one where that doesn't exist and figure out, okay, well actually fundamentally, like why, why should someone buy online? Like how did we convince people to buy online 20 plus years ago? So I think that's kind of like the, the really like the key thing that, that we're trying to solve for. In terms of how we do that, some of this is gonna sound extremely basic, it is. Um, but again, it's, it is actually kind of about going back to basics, which you're, if you're a big brand, used to operating in a market like the UK or the US, et cetera, you, you kind of forget how to do. So I think one is really like identifying who your initial target customer is. Again, like that probably sounds like marketing 101, but Moonpig in the UK actually has a surprisingly broad and diverse customer base in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of income, et cetera. Um, but if we, so we're actually kind of marketing to everyone here and, and in the Netherlands as well. But in a new market like Australia, if we go in and try to target everyone, again, we're probably gonna fail, or at the very least, we're gonna have to spend way more money to, to kind of get where we wanna be because we're just not gonna see that immediate return on the investment. So for us, again, it's kind of doing what, what a startup would do, which is trying to figure out who, who are most likely to be your early adopters. Um, so, I mean, what we found is that's millennials. If I'm being more specific, it's urban millennial women. Um, the reason for that is because they're kind of at the right life stage. People in their 20s tend not to really send that many greeting cards, even in the UK. Um, it is something that starts happening once you have kids, once you get married, etc. cetera. Um, so it is kind of a life stage phenomenon. Um, you also start having many more potential recipients. So I mentioned kids, kids, uh, friends' kids. You maybe have in-laws all of a sudden. There are many more card buying occasions that you suddenly have. Um, and then obviously like millennials have grown up with the internet are more likely to understand how you can, or that, how you can buy a card online um, than someone who's a, who's a little bit older. Not, not to be ageist, but we've generally found that to, to be the case. Then like explaining the concept. Um, so this is something that I'm kind of obsessed with because even when I was at Lego, this proved extraordinarily difficult. Again, like when I was at Lego, I think it's not, it's not rocket science, it's 
interlocking plastic bricks. It's a, it's a toy. Um, and I think if you grow up in the UK or the US or Germany or, or you know, most Western markets, many people here probably play with Lego or at least know what it is. Your parents probably know what it is or and maybe even played with it. Your grandparents probably know what Lego is and, and possibly played with it. Um, but then we go to new markets and actually customers would buy a box of Lego and then return it and say, hey, this model is broken. Because they just fundamentally didn't understand that what you're meant to do with Lego is is actually build the set yourself, and that is like the value of the of the toy. Um, similarly, when we when we think about Moonpig, what's really tough is again trying to tell people in markets where this online channel does not exist that it's a physical card that you buy online, not an e-card, physical card, but you happen to be buying it online. Weirdly, that's just really, really, really difficult to communicate. So. There are kind of a whole number of ways we, we try to go around it. This is just one example of one creative from a, um, a direct mail campaign that we did in Australia relatively recently. But we really like thought about each element of this, right? We have better creatives than this, but I think this is a good e illustration of like how we've tried to really think about every single element. So first of all, we're showing very clearly that there are physical cards. And there's no communication or no asset that we have that doesn't either explicitly say or show that we have physical cards. Two is we're telling people that this is in every way we can, that this is an online store, this is e-commerce, either by explicitly saying it, putting the search bar. So weirdly, we've done a lot of testing around this and our conversion just go or click through goes up massively when we include the search bar because it just helps people kind of intuitively understand what the concept is much, much better. Um, and then you have this kind of like classic three-step startup infographic at the bottom, which you know just very simply explains how it works. So there are lots of different ways we do it. This is probably like the most naughty version of it, but we're really like thinking about these three things in any communication or any asset that we, we put out there. I think another really important thing is, you know, it's great to show how it works or like tell people how it works and, and that's obviously like a, uh, a great hurdle if we can overcome that. But that doesn't actually tell people why they should buy online, right? Like that's not a reason in and of itself to go buy online um, and, and change that very ingrained behavior. So we actually have like lots of USPs, right? Like if I think about our business in the UK, we can talk about the fact that we have the biggest range in the world. We can talk about the fact that it's really convenient in the exact same way all e-commerce is. You can send things direct to the participant, never have to go to the post office and you know, buy a stamp and all of that fab. Um, and we also have a lot of great features, which, which I talked about um, previously. But actually, like, the key thing is like, what, what can, what's just something cool that you can do with Moonpig online that you cannot replicate offline, or at least it's very difficult to replicate offline. And that's as simple as adding a photo to the front of the card. Um, sounds really simple, but in a lot of markets, this actually doesn't exist because the market has always been offline. So actually to kind of see this for the first time, it's like, okay, yeah, actually like that's, that's pretty cool. I would love to do that. I would love to add some photos. Um, and, and that's actually the reason then to change your behavior rather than just go to the supermarket or however any other, however many other points of purchase that you pass during that day where you can buy greeting cards, you actually bother to come to our website, figure out how it works and place an order with us. One other thing that's like, I think kind of important to note here is, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot that you can do with a Moonpig card now, right? You can like embed a video, you can embed an audio file, there's a lot you can do on the inside of the card besides that. And I think this is extremely frustrating for our product team because they've done all this incredible work loading up the card with all these quite cool features. In international markets, we talk about none of that because it's just too confusing. We've tried doing that, but if you go out and can, even though we have this great product, I think, if you go out and try to talk about videos in the card, if you try to talk about audio files in the card or adding a gift experience into the card, when people don't even understand that it's a physical card that you're buying online in the first place, it's just, it just gets weirdly like very, very confusing. And it's not treating, it's not about treating consumers like idiots, it's just, you know, people aren't looking at these things for very long. If they're not kind of understanding the, the, the concept in, in just like a second, then, then we've lost the battle. 
Um, so it's very frustrating for our marketing teams, or sorry, our uh, product teams, but we really, really, really have basically kind of gone back to the playbook from the UK 20 years ago, despite all the advances that we've, we've made on the platform since. And hopefully we can then go on an accelerated journey and start talking about some of these new features as the market matures, right? So Ireland, we launched last year, it's gone super well, we've grown really quickly. Um, and in that market, actually, we now are able to talk a little bit more about some of the other features we have, which is, which is great. But certainly in newer markets, it's really just what is kind of the one single hook that will convince some that people A, understand, and B, convinces them to, to actually change their behavior to, to buy from us. Now, unfortunately, the next two slides, the videos aren't working, so there were meant to be videos here, but they weren't that exciting. Basically, from a leverage channel perspective, a right channel perspective, what I was going to say is, you know, we've been testing pretty much every channel that you can think of internationally. Um, and, and in different markets, different channels work. So that experimentation is super important. There's no, I don't think, there's really like one playbook that you can take everywhere. Um, but I think, having said that, there are channels that work better than others in the situation that we're in. So what I was going to show here is it's actually like an influencer video. And actually, influencers have proved a, a great channel for us because you can do all those things that I just talked about. Because you can actually like quite clearly explain how it works, have someone kind of going through the journey online, ha see them receiving a, a physical card. It's, it's just much easier to do that than it is with like a static Facebook or, or Instagram ad. So I think influencers in our particular situation have worked really well. And that's actually kind of interesting because in the UK, we actually don't really work with influencers much at all. It's just, it's not a channel that we've invested a huge amount in, we've seen great returns on, but in international markets, it's, it's pretty critical for us. And then, again, the video isn't working here, but the final thing I was gonna say is, it's really important, important not to forget the impact. Because one of the things that we've seen in other markets, especially the US, is there are other people who have seen the success Moon Big has had in the UK and tried to replicate that business model elsewhere. Most of them have either failed or, or just, I don't know, not done that well. It's you know, hard to generalize exactly why, but my personal hypothesis is that one of the really big reasons people have not got this right is because actually like, they are startups in those situations. They're doing all the things I literally just talked about, but they're kind of forgetting the, the impact piece which is kind of like the, the why you should be doing this in the first place. And when I say impact, I'm talking about what it actually means to receive a, a Moonpig card. Again, we found influencers are, are really important for this, but being able to kind of like, so we had this very successful campaign in Father's Day in Australia very recently, and we had you know, these great videos, mainly from mom influencers who were showing dads receiving cards that like their kids had designed, and it just kind of brought to life, not only like what you can do with Moonpig in terms of customizing the card or whatever, but the impact of, of what that means and help show why that should be a much more meaningful experience than just getting a regular card from the supermarket or Scribbler or Card Factory or, or whatever. So I think showing that impact piece, whatever product category you're, you're in, is, is also really important. So that's it, key takeaways. International expansion, it's pretty challenging. I think mindset actually though is, is one of the key things that I would always recommend focusing on. Um, and I think in terms of doing that, really trying to think about like, what do startups do and adopting that startup mentality. And in a perfect world, actually hiring some people who have startup experience, like everyone in, in my team does, um, is, is one way you can try to overcome that. Cool, that's it. I don't know if there are any questions.